Okay, we're happy to start the uh, workshop with Ricardo Schiappa, who will tell us about resurgence and trans series in string theory. Okay, thank you very much. Also, I was very happy to be in Jake Also, very happy to be here. It's very nice to be by team. Unfortunately, I'm here for a very short stint due to earlier commitments, but I'm happy to talk straight after anyone who's interested in doing lunch time or whatever. So, basically, I'm going to keep going from the simplest possible examples that I was. Uh, describing for you at school to the hardest possible examples that we have been working at without any intermezzo. And this is work that's been going on through the past 10 years with a lot of people. And papers that are in bold are basically the ones I'm going to be touching a little bit more. All right, so just a quick reminder of what we were doing during school. We're looking at asymptotic series. Here I'm denoting my asymptotic series with an F because I'll be looking at a lot of free energies. And the coupling, I'm now denoting with a Z, and I'm doing perturbative expansion around Z equals infinity. That's because I'm going to be looking at the series of large n theories. And as you recall, just a quick recap, coefficients grow factorially fast. You remember we discussed all these. We had to remove the factorial growth using the Borel transform just to look at the subleading exponential growth. If I have this subleading exponential growth, you, always, you also remember that then I can do an elliptic continuation of my Borel transform and define basically the Borel resummation by this Laplace type integral, right? And if you recall, all this was very well defined, except if the ray of integration hits a singularity, then I have to decide, am I going to go to the left, am I going to go to the right? These lines are Stokes lines. And you also recall, I, I was not too specific about this, but the type of singularities that we find are usually of this type down here. So there's a, a broader definition of what the resurgent function is. We don't care. We're just going to focus on these ones, which have locked branch cuts at every singularity. And just to, for you to know the name, this is known as a simple resurgent function. Okay. And if you recall, so the Borel of f is some Stokes coefficient or Borel residue times the resurgence of something else and the log branch cut and plus holomorphic stuff, I don't care. Right? You all remember this from the lectures at the school. So that when we cross a Stokes line, the left becomes the right up to the sum over all these Hankel contours. The sum of the contour of integration around every possible logarithmic singularity that I find. And if you put it in a calculation, the difference between the left and the right gives you a discontinuity. And that discontinuity is the sum over basically the resurgence of everybody at each singularity times an exponentially suppressed term. And remember that I'm doing perturbation theory around z equals infinity, which means that this guy is not an elliptic. Okay? So we're basically everything like we were discussing at the school. Now, what am I going to be interested in applying these methods? I'm going to be interested in string theory and large n. And also large n per se and large n from the point of view of gauge gravity as well. And the, the class of models where we have more, more results is basically the B model on local Calabiades. This we know that they are dual to large n dual to matrix models, the world work of Dacroft and Vasa, where the class of target geometries is basically of this form. So it's a vibration, the U and V are the fibers, over some uh, algebraic surface given by the, the zero locus of this function here, H. So the non-trivial information about the geometry is encoded in this Riemann surface. And this is very interesting because it's a very explicit case of large duality because the spectral curve of the matrix model is precisely this Riemann surface. So you, know, you can see uh, from both points of view the connection towards gauge theory or the connection back gravity. Now what's known for probably 15 years or so is that the special geometry of the Calabi-Yau solves three-level closed string theory. And it's, that means that it gives you the planar solution to your matrix model. This has been extended to all genera, I think maybe in 2005 or so, maybe later, uh, by looking at the full large N expansion, the full asymptotic perturbative expansion, which matches against the string perturbative expansion. The question we have is, can we go beyond that asymptotic large n expansion? Can I really establish this large n duality at full on perturbative level? So I have a function on one side, and I have the same function on the other side of the same chain of variance. 
All right, so that's what we're going to talk about. Let's start with just, uh, again, a few more reminders uh, from, from what I was discussing at the school, because one way that we're going to be doing this is we're going to be constructing these, these trans series, these non-perturbative solutions, and uh, we don't have theorems, unlike in most situations in, in the math literature. So what we have to do to make sure that these trans series will move forward are correct is to make checks. And the way we do that is by using numerical checks, and that connects to asymptotics. This was the plot that I was trying to do very poorly on the blackboard two days ago. And so we're going to validate the structure by using numerical results. So let me just quickly review uh, how do we apply these numericals and these asymptotics. So we already know that in order to describe general non-analytic functions, we enlarge power series which are based on monomials here, monomials around x equals zero, to transmonomials. Here are some examples of transmonomials. We already also discussed this. There's exponential height, logarithmic depth. Most of the time, I'm just going to be looking at these two. But generically, the others can also be there. By the way, let me say one thing, which is, if there is a, a height 2 exponential, this is really hard to see in the numerics. This is already hard to see because, you know, it's beyond all orders in perturbation theory. This is beyond all orders in non-perturbative expansion. So it's, it, they're, they're hard to check. So, I mean, in some cases, we know they're not there. In other cases, we don't know. But well, we know, haven't seen them yet. Do you know how to interpret that physically? First of all, just no, because if even for the instantons, some of them we know how to interpret physically, others we don't. But I'll come back to that in okay. short. So the one parameter trans series is going to be looking like that. This is something that I already wrote at the school, right? So we have the sum of all instanton guys. That's the multi instanton action, the n instanton, the loop expansion around the n instanton, some possibly. Uh, coefficients there, just associated to the something general of your theories and so on. Sigma, remember, was the the, the trans series parameter. I discussed how it connects to a choice of boundary conditions, so we've seen that. And so basically, this is the answer. So just plug into our nonlinear problem, crank the wheel, and see what comes up. And resurgence, remember, we also discussed this. Is the statement that coefficients at different uh, loop order and that different instanton number, they relate to each other. So the slogan here is that you can obtain non-perturbative data out of perturbative data. So let's try to make these things a little bit more explicit. So we know that the Borel singularities are now going to look like this. It's more specific than what I've shown you before because I know that the nth factor, remember that the nth is the nth, it's the asymptotic series around the n instanton sector. The nth guy, at its kth singularity, sees the resurgence of the nth plus kth guy. Okay. So we can just grab this, put it into our, our you know, relations of Borel resubmission and see what comes up. And what comes up is the following. Uh, sorry, before that. Um, and we're going to do this for string theory, right? For string theory, what happens is that the free energy has a so-called genus expansion. What does that mean? That means that it's in powers of basically the Euler number, 2g minus 2 of the string coupling, gs. And the coefficients in front, they're not just numbers, they're functions. From the point of view of the gauge theory, they're functions of the Toft moduli. From the point of view of the string theory, they're functions, say, of uh, the Euler structure or the complex structure or whatever you decide to do, a model or b model. They're basically, if you want, they are functions of the, of, the, of the geometry, of the moduli of the geometry. And the large order growth is goes as 2G factorial, not just as G factorial, that's associated to that 2G. It's also associated to the fact that I'm doing a closed string expansion. And the multi-instantons, they're going to be open string expansions. It turns out that they're just powers of G and not of 2G. So if I were to try to say, OK, I'm computing a trans series from some string theory, and now I want a number. I want to know what's the value of free energy at some value of the string coupling. So I have to do Borel resummation, which in practice will translate to Borel pavé. What does that mean? That means that these Fs, I don't have access to all of them, because this is a strongly nonlinear problem. I can only compute so many. I mean, you know, depending on the power of your computer and your coding skills, the more you can, but it's always a finite number. So I, I will not know this function exactly, but I can approximate it with a Pade approximate. That's just basically a rational approximation to the function I'm looking for. Why is this rational approximation useful? 
because basically it will have singularities. And so when I make plots on the computer on what's going on on the Borel plane, I will see a bunch of poles accumulating into the would-be logarithmic branch cut. So it's actually a very useful approximation. Um, also, the integration, sorry. The integration has to be performed numerically most of the time, again, because I have finite data on this. And then, eventually, what I want to do is to plug this back into the trans series, which means that the sort of the, the numeric resummation I'm doing is Borel, because Borel wrote the summation, Pade, because of the approximation, and Decal, because this guy came up with trans series in this business, which means that I should be still summing all the possible resummations I've done of the n instanton sectors weighted by instanton weights. And again, because it's a strongly nonlinear problem, I have so many data, I will not be able to have the sum up to n equals infinity, but just a bunch of instantons. Some plots I might show you are up to three or four instantons. And that's the approximation we do. Okay, can I ask yeah. a question? Sure. Yeah, so, so these three, these f g of t, in principle, we expand them in positive Tukovic. Say, say a lot of it. These f g's of t, yes. we expand them in positive Tukovic usually. No, no, we so know them so exactly. Yeah, so that, this is my question. So yeah. here you have a method where yeah, you yeah. just we know, we know the function. Exactly. Yeah, we compute the function. This, this is easy, this is not a problem. Okay. <clears throat> so once we have this resummation, or at least this approximation to the resummation, I will also try to discuss some analytics. This will allow us to reach arbitrary coupling, arbitrarily strong coupling, arbitrarily negative coupling, arbitrary complex coupling. You can go anywhere you want. So you can venture into the complex plane easily as long as you incorporate Stokes phenomenon. Remember that Stokes phenomenon is basically the same idea we had before, is that I cross, the left is equal to the right up to the sum of Henkel contours. That's true for each element in the trans series, but you know, funny enough, if I take into account the whole trans series, that in some simple directions, that amounts to a change, a jump of the trans series parameter precisely by the Stokes constant, S1. And there's more to it than just meets the eye immediately because if I had started with sigma equals zero and all I had was my perturbative series, this jump tells me that, hey, hang on, you have to look for another exponential with suppressed guy. And then if I'm going around on the complex plane, the exponential with suppressed guy is going to start growing. It's going to eat the same magnitude as the and that's known as an anti-Stokes line, where I'll have a phase transition. And I'll show you what happens on phase transitions where basically space-time interpretation changes from being you know, a dominant uh, geometry to being a fluctuation of geometries. So now I wanted to tell you uh, how are we going to do these tests compared to asymptotics. Basically, we can compute all these discontinuities exactly. Here's a formula. Let's not care too much about the details. And then we can write down large order expressions. We already saw this expression in particular at the school, where I have the leading factorial growth. So here I'm just doing for g, 2g is the same. The subleading exponential, there's Stokes constants. And then there's the one loop, two loops around the one instanton. Then there's exponentially suppressed stuff. This exponential suppressed 2 to the minus g, right? And then there's the, the, the one loop around the two instanton, the two loop around the two instanton, so on. This goes as 1 over g's, and it keeps going. And as long as I'm just doing the perturbative, and I'm sort of looking forward to you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 15 instant arms, all I see are powers of the Stokes constant. So here's a picture of what's going on. So uh, all the instant arms are telling me exactly what is the large order growth of the Fs. And as we've discussed at the school, these arrows can go both ways. So I can also use the perturbative content to decode non-perturbative content, as long as I know how to expand the sequences that I'm finding here, these asymptotic sequences, in their powers of 1 over g, and in their powers of exponentials of g's, and so on. The hard part is that we need these Stokes constants. These Stokes constants are generically difficult numbers to compute, and it's not just that I need, like in the previous slide, that I need, the you know, two previous slides, that I need S1, S1, squared as one cube, what happens is that if I start looking at the instantons, I need more guys, because here I'm looking at the third instanton, and it's got contributions from the people ahead, but it also has contributions from the people before. And as we've also discussed at the school, the people before has a whole lot more Stokes constants, so things get much messier. Here's an example of what's going on at the nth guy, at leading order, so I have here the, the guy who is forward, but I also have the guy who is back. So plus one instanton, minus one instanton. 
the instant on actions here that comes with an ace, the guy is forward, that comes with a minus ace, the guy which is back. So far not terribly bad. The guy who is forward is the S1 constant, but now the guy which is back is S minus 1, and then there's going to be an S minus 2 and Z minus 3 and so on. I'll show you some of these numbers. We don't know what they are. String theory is slightly more complicated because string theory is always going to have an instant on action A and an instant on action minus A. This is um, something I will not discuss too much. It's associated with a phenomenon called resonance, and resonance is what somehow explains why the string perturbative expansion is in powers of G string squared from this point of view, uh, rather than in powers of GS. So it's because these systems are resonant that the, the you know that you can see that the perturbative is GS squared while the non-perturbative is just GS. The added feature of this is that now, and here here is one way in which you can check is that again you have the A and the minus A, but because of resonance, these Stokes constants are related to each other. So you know, deciding whether you're seeing some expansion in powers of GS squared or GS is just you know plugging in the computer and you either see only this guy, and that would be dot 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 dot, or you have both of them, which is an A and the minus A, and then you see dot 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 dot. And so it's ultra clear to see this numerically and try to decide what's going on. And I'm not even going to write down formulae for what happens in string theory for multi instantons. We have some of them, but it's just a huge mess. All right, so this has been seen in many examples, so it's you know, pretty much, I would say, guaranteed that it's going to work like that. Lots of large end gauge theories, transignments, APGM, lots of um, matrix models, one cut, two cuts, so on. Um, non critical string theory, topological string, so there's a lot of examples. So let me give you some of these examples in a little bit condensed way. All right, let's start with string theory. So we're looking at the string, the logical string, the B model, on a local clavial, and which is mirrored to some toric threefold. And as I've discussed it, um, the Riemann surface uh, is basically, that I'm going to be interested in, is basically the mirror curve of this geometry and is going to be matching against some matrix model dual. But now let's forget about the matrix model dual and then just look at this from the point of view of string theory. So the string free energy, which is this, we've already seen, Z is some one line out, GS is the, you know, the, the real thing where it's the resurgent variable, the thing which is associated with this dot expansion. How do I compute it? In this case, the GSG free energy depends on the mean model on the complex structure moduli, Z. And you would expect that it is naively that this dependence would be holomorphic, but it is. There is a, 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 a non-holomorphic, it's a holomorphic anomaly, if you want. There's a non-holomorphic contribution to the free energies. Schematically, this is associated to the fact that the moduli space of genus G surfaces has a boundary. If I were to compute the derivative, the dependence of the free energy with respect to the anti-holomorphic parameter, basically it's given by a total derivative of, uh, of uh, the integration over the moduli space of, free G, of um, genus G Riemann surfaces, and that has a boundary. Here's a very simple way to see that um, genus 2 surfaces have two ways in which they have natural boundaries that they generate to lower, uh, lower genus uh, surfaces by just pinching, say, a cycle around, around one of, of, of the genera or by just pinching it into two. And schematically, this translates to the fact that this pinching gives me something which has genus minus one. That's this contribution here. This D is an adequate derivative. I might show it in the next slide. And this, this gives you a disconnected pieces of surfaces whose sum over genera basically give you the starting genera. That's the sum here. G minus H plus H gives G. And these are the famous holomorphic anomaly equations. And they tell you what is the anti-holomorphic dependence of the FG, but it turns out that they, you can also use them to compute the FG, put them in the computer, and, well, not as high as you want. There's some limits because of boundary conditions, but at least a very high gender. Certainly for the cases we're looking at, which are non-compact local collabias, you can go as high as you want. For the compact case, I think you can go to 50. Two or fifty three something. Um, all right. So the example I'll be telling you about now is the B model on the mirror of the, that you know that canonical bundle vibration over P two, which is known as local P two. This has been fully solved perturbatively by Clam and collaborators using the holomorphic anomaly equations. Here's the holomorphic anomaly equations written exactly, where I have just used this this variable here, this S variable is known as the propagator variable. It's an adequate variable which uh, basically absorbs the Yukawa couplings. 
and it's got both the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic dependence. So basically, it goes anti anti-holomorphic dependence. And this this partial D is just a standard derivative. This capital D is a covariant derivative in complex structure modeling space. The exact form of these objects is really not important. What's important is to realize that this is a recursive relation. If I know lower genera people, I can compute the next guy. And just put it in the computer and go on. So the question now is, how will these guys grow? So they have both holomorphic and anti-holomorphic dependence on the complex structure moduli. What's the large order behavior? Am I going to have an instant, a holomorphic instant on action that somehow controls the, both the, the general and the holomorphic limit where I can make a connection to matrix models? Or am I going to have also an extension an anti-holomorphic extension of the instant on action. That's one question. How can we do that? Well, one way is to rewrite the holomorphic anomaly equations for the partition function. You know, if I were to start just with the recursion relation that I have here, how am I going to specify that I want to include non-perturbative data? It's not really clear, right? In fact, you can. If I rewrite those equations for the partition function, then instead of saying that the partition function is an exponential of some perturbative expansion, in I can say that the partition function is the exponential of some non perturbative expansion. And then that's good. Because if you do that, you, you, have, you find two things. The first, and now I'm just simplifying for uh, modelized space of dimension one, just to be simple. The first is that Z satisfies a sort of heat equation. That's a heat equation in modelized space up to some initial date. It doesn't really matter. If you plug back in just that Z is the exponential of F0 into the heat equation, you get back the holomorphic anomaly equations of the COV. But if you plug in the full thingy, you get back an extension of the holomorphic anomaly equations, which you can call the non-perturbative holomorphic anomaly equations. Notice that they're very similar. So they start with the anti-holomorphic derivative of Fg, now for any instanton number n. They have a quote unquote covariant extension. The A n is just n times A. On the right hand side, now I have a generalization of the second derivative, of the second covariant derivative. Now it's this curly D. It doesn't matter what it is, just to, to, to tell you the structure, I'm just going to go to plots next. And then at next order, I have products of the simple derivatives. There's one, there's another one, and they are again quote unquote covariantized by the addition of this partial D. The structure is very much the same. At leading order, the instant on actions are holomorphic. That's actually good, because we're used to thinking of the A, the instant on action, as combinations of periods in the geometry. And periods are holomorphic, so this better be the case. That works out. And then once you do that, now you just crank the wheel. And notice that here I have N and G, and here I either have smaller genera or smaller instantons. Up to n minus one. So again, this is completely recursive, non in the non-perturbative coefficients, and I can just crank the wheel. All right. So this is the structure. It's really not relevant. What's the content? What's relevant is the idea. If I know lower genera, lower instantons, I can produce data. Let's see what we can do with that data. Well, we can find some things. We can find that the structure of the solutions is of this form. So basically, this is a result that was already known. For the perturbative cases, are polynomials in S of the degree. 3g minus 3. And if you go non perturbative, in the standard topological string, you also get polynomials times exponential coefficients. These exponential coefficients, they basically come from this guy here. And this story can be extended to, to the refined topological string in the Nekrasov Satashvili limit. Let's not get into that. All right, what can we do now with all these things? Let's test if this trans series, which is computed with this extension of the holomorphic anomaly equation to the non-perturbative realm, this recursive relation that is giving me coefficients at higher genera and at higher instanton for string theory, is that hands up correct in any way? Well, let's plot some things. Uh, what are the possible instanton actions we could find? So we're trying to associate this to cycles and geometry, so we're looking Yes, sorry. Question, we were going to that. So I'm a bit uh, uh, confused. So what is data you need? Just not just the probability. Uh, so, uh, my question is, uh, 
if you can just, uh, if, you know, from a perturbative series, if you can uh, reconstruct everything, that sounds as if uh, non perturbative compression is unique. But uh, I No, it's not unique know. because there's a transverse parameter. Uh -huh. So you right? need some additional data to fix it. Uh, some, well, it doesn't have to be data. If, if The way I like to think about it is you need a boundary condition. So you need a, a physical input somehow. Mm -hmm. You say, I'm looking at some. And so when you say, and that's including that, you're. No, no. So when, when, when I say ansatz, I mean that I leave the transverse parameter arbitrary. Uh -huh. I cannot fix it uh -huh. immediately for two reasons. First, because you know, there might be some physical requirement that I want to decide, do I want this, do I want that? Let's see what happens if I fix sigma to one thing or the other. And the next thing is that every time I cross a Stokes line, that sigma is jumping. So I better know where it's going to be, because otherwise when I cross a Stokes line, I'm lost. I don't know why it was jumping. So that's sort of kept. Um, there, undefined, and then later on when I have the final answer, then I see should I fix it to this or, or not, but at least I know when there's Stokes crossings, I know how it's going to jump. Right. All right, so local P2, where do I have uh, single points in the geometry? I have single point that there's a conical point in complex structure, uh, that is, you can think of it basically as, as a sphere if you want plane or whatever, and uh, z at minus 1 over 27, you have a singularity mm. to which I can associate a, a, an instanton action by just computing bigger flux around them, you know, just compute the sign. It turns out that the coordinate which is useful to use is the psi, which is basically you know, square root of z, whatever. So I have three conifold points at cubic roots of unity, and if I solve bigger flux and see what comes out, the instanton actions look like this. There's a number times this tc. This tc is known as the flat coordinate the flat coordinate around the conical point, which is basically written here. So it's just a sum over complicated hypergeometric functions. Anyways, it's something you can compute. Let's not worry. Let's imagine I computed it. So now I know these instant on actions. Let me plot it. So the, for the first conical point, it's written in blue. It's the line in blue. And then there's another one that I'm not including here. That's the large radius. That's just 4 pi square i. <coughs> that's something that kicks in at, at large radius, which is associated with the contribution from the constant map. I plot it in red, okay? And now I use, let's go back a little while, I use this formula. I'm going to be out and in here, I'm just using the standard holomorphic anomaly equation to compute perturbative data. I'm gonna compute a lot of these guys. And I'm going to check whether at large order, there, what is, their prediction for the instant on action. This is just by looking at the sequence and extracting it, subleading in a factorial contribution. That's the green dots. So what do we have? I think we have something that matches. Right spot on. So that gives us a lot of confidence that we have identified the instant on action adequately. That's the first step. What about non-perturbative data? So this is just out of the perturbative sequence, and this is telling me that its growth, its exponential growth, matches against the actions we should expect to have computed. That's not the whole the whole story. So I have these three instanton actions. They have some adequate structure on the complex plane. Let's not worry about that. There is another one. This, there's this large radius point, which in the z coordinates is at zero, psi coordinates at infinity which also has an associated instant on action, that's the 4 pi squared i times the, the adequate flat coordinate. And if you use it here, you can compute it using the mirror map. Again, you take it out of the Fox, And it's just a, a complicated Meyer-G function. But anyways, it's something you can compute. So now I have this a1, a2, a3, and the Kähler instant on action, or the large radius. How do they fight against each other for dominance on the growth because they, you know, they're not all, in, all contributing at the same time. So here's one of these borel Pade um, results. Again, all out of the perturbative series and nothing else. So I grab the perturbative series computed with the standard holomorphic anomaly and I compute the Borel transform. Now I don't know the whole perturbative series so I can only approximate the Borel transform. And I do a borel Pade approximation. And then it's going to have poles and I'm going to plot the poles. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm plotting poles. And I, what I'm doing is I'm varying psi 
and seeing what happens, how do these poles move around as I vary the modulo. And then on top of those dots, I am plotting trajectories which are followed as I vary psi by each of the instanton actions. And the color code is basically the same. So the red is a 1, the green is a 2, the blue is a 3, and purple is scalar. And I'm not plotting all the A's. I'm just plotting the first conifold and the second conifold and the calyx. And so I put a box around the leading guy, around exactly where I'm supposed to have the instanton action, to see that the perturbative is really putting me a pole right there, plus a tail, which is the log branch cut. And you see that, you know, they're spot on as I vary. There's one interesting thing that's going on here in this plot, which is, let's follow the trajectory of the Kaler gap. Because, you know, you could say that as I, you know, take psi very far, eventually the trajectory of the Kaler gap should be dominant and not the conifold. But that's not what happens. If you follow the Kaler guy, he's there, he's there, he's there, he's sort of crossing the tail of conifold 2 and, well, He's gone. So there's the, the Stokes constants are going to have moduli dependence. And depending on where I am on moduli space, they can actually vanish. So there's an extra complication that I'm not going to talk about. It's associated to parametric resurgence, which tells me that when I am looking at resurgence and I have parameters vary, uh, I also have to look at what's going on with the Stokes constants parametrically. So it's not like if they were hard enough to start off with because they're numbers that are very hard to compute except numerically. Now, there are numbers that are very hard to compute numerically, except numerically, and yet they depend on the parameters. So this is sort of complicated. But I can do tests that are validating for me that these instant on actions are there. They have parameter dependence, which might be harder or easier, but they're all there. Oh, exactly. What if I want... Uh, what, what do you mean by pole disappears? By By pole disappears? Uh, I just don't see it there anymore. No, no. Is it like coefficient becomes zero? Or it's like it, what? Is it becomes, uh, the coefficient becomes zero or it goes to the other branch? The right. Th that's something that people uh, have thought for a while is that what I could be thinking of is that the, the <coughs> Borel surface is, is multi sheeted and it's going to another branch. But here we think that it's parametric dependence. It's not going to another branch. It's really the All right. So I think. I sort of convinced you that the perturbative is predicting the instant action. Well, uh, what about if I want to go non-perturbative? I could do tests of the conifold one instant on. I know how to compute it from the holomorphic anomaly equations. That's this expression. I know here everything. I know what the polynomial is. I know what these variables are. I'm just not writing them out for you because there's several pages of, of calculations in some of them. And I can test the larger the growth of this guy against the sequence from perturbative guys and from previous, so I'm testing here the one instant on around the conifold at say 0, 1, 2, 3 loop level and I'm comparing it against perturbative and the previous guys that I've already checked and validated. And I'm going to do that at three different points in moduli space and here's the result. So it's h equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, uh, sorry, 0, 1, 2, 3. And I'm doing this, the x, basically I'm varying the value of the propagator around its holomorphic value. That's what I'm doing here. And what's blue is the real contribution, what's green is the imaginary contribution at those three points in moduli space. And I think, you know, I don't have to say anything else. The dots are the numerical results. The, the dashed are the functions that we predicted. They're spot on. We can go on, do this for the two instant on. Let's not go through all the details. The idea is the same. Let me just show you numerical against analytic. So this should be convincing that the train series we've constructed for local P2 is correct. So the next question you might have is, yeah, that's great. Now what are you going to do with it? Here's something that you can do with it. For strings in local P2, there's actually a non-perturbative definition of what the theory should be by Marcus Marino and collaborators. And it actually extends to any toric Claudia geometry. And this, this, this definition says that what I should be doing is I should be looking at the mirror curve here written in exponential variables. And I should be quantizing the mirror curve. I'm sort of quantizing the geometry. 
So basically, I impose you know, the standard computation relations to P and X. And then, you know, in one slide, and I don't want to get too much into this definition because it's a very interesting thing in itself that deserves a full seminar. Uh, the inverse operator of the quantization of the curve, rho, is an operator in L2R, which is trace class and positive definite. So this is even better than standard quantum mechanical operators in one-dimensional undergraduate quantum mechanics. And the partition function in the Conifold frame basically follows from the spectral trace expansion of the Fredholm determinant. So if I look at the Fredholm determinant and I expand it here in the, the spectral parameter, I should be able to get the partition functions all there. So that's the definition, you know, in a nutshell. Do our results match against this, or don't they? Here's a check. So what I'm plotting here for different values of n and lambda, and so different things are appearing. So before I was doing g string and t or z for the moduli, now I'm doing n and lambda. This is just because I'm taking plots from uh, different papers, but you should think generically as n, quote unquote, is gs, and lambda, whatever appears, is just a model. So let's not worry too much about that. And in red, these are exact results. They're computed out of these calculations. These calculations involve you know, quantum dialogues, so it's highly non-trivial functions, highly weird numbers appear. And the trans series is a trans series, and it's plot here by the black line, just the perturbative. And you say, okay, that's amazing. That's really cool. It matches. Well, why do you care about non-perturbative stuff? You're already spun on. And I say, well, yeah, that's because your eyes or mine are not good enough. If we start zooming in, we see that there's a systematic discrepancy. All right? Not noticeable at the naked eye. So how, how, did, how did you fit the trans series parameters? I will come to that in a second. Uh, so basically, the, the way if you want to do is you do a measurement. You stand on a, on a place and see, okay, can I match? I can. Now let's take it everywhere else. Yes. That's it. But it will come again in the next slide. All right, so there's a systematic discrepancy. That systematic discrepancy better be controlled by the non-perturbative you know, content of the trans series that I just computed. So here's a check whether that's true or not. I'm going around n, and, and by the way, here, I should have put that in the previous uh, slide. So you see here that h bar is basically g string, and lambda is n over h bar, so that I include the g string, includes the flat coordinate around the quantifold point. So I, you know, there's, there's a map between whatever notation I had before, whatever notation I had. No, let's not worry about that. So now I'm varying n, and I'm varying h bar over pi. What I'm doing here is I'm plotting the difference between um, the systematic discrepancy, and basically matching the systematic discrepancy that I had before, against the contribution that should come. So here is the exact minus the perturbative resum guy. So it's, this is the systematic discrepancy that I could not see in the previous plot against the one instant on that I computed from the trans series. And basically, the color code is basically, if you have a circle, it matches. If you have a cross, it doesn't. That, that, that's, I'm sorry, that, that's the, the, the picture code. The color code is associated with how many digits of precision I have. Let's not worry about the color code. So let's just worry about that I have a match here, and then I have a mismatch here. And you say, well, that was almost good. But then you say, well, what's the boundary? What's that dashed line? This dashed line, this boundary, is the Stokes line for conifold 2. Then you say, hang on, if there's a Stokes line, maybe there's Stokes phenomenon. So what happens if I do Stokes phenomenon? What, what happens when I cross the Stokes line by incorporating Stokes phenomenon? Oh, then everything matches on the other side, as expected. So it's not only that I am validating the, the, the one instant on, so the, the, the beginning of my non-perturbative uh, trans series, but I'm also validating the Stokes lines and the Stokes jumps associated with the adequate uh, conifold actions. So that's great. You say, okay, that's, that's, that's interesting, but what if you had more than one non-perturbative definition in the literature? What should I do? And then you say, well, for local P2 there is. Yeah, but what about local P1 cross P1? In this case, there's two distinct non-perturbative definitions. There's the one that from Marino and collaborators on the quantization of the mirror curve that basically goes the same story. But there's another one based on, on large and duality to turn Simon's partition function on a lens space, which localizes to a two-cut matrix model. So this is, I, I don't, uh, we don't have an answer for this yet. This is something we're looking at. Well, but there's some things that we can discuss. The first question is, in what or how much do these definitions differ? This has nothing to do with transfers. 
there any way to decide which is true? Or let, let me just finish this discussion and then hopefully your, your question is answered. In, how, in what do these definitions differ is a, is, is a question just in the definitions themselves. It has nothing to do with transients, right? But in how much do they differ? You can say they only can differ by exponentially suppressed stuff because the perturbative series better match. That's how somehow they were constructed. And then you say, okay, if they only differ by non-perturbative content, can the same trans series match both results or not? Well, if you try to do the trans series by the way that I have just explained to you, that's what comes out. The only freedom I have is in the trans series parameter. But the trans series parameter, I told you, you should think of it as a boundary condition. So you could think that these two different definitions are associated to different choices of quote-unquote boundary conditions at the level of the trans series parameter. And if I choose one Stokes, uh, I'm sorry, one trans series parameter, I match against one definition. And I should, if I choose another, I will match against the other definition. So what the trans series is doing, if you want, is giving you a semi-classical decoding of the non-perturbative definition. You know, if I give a non-perturbative definition where there was a you know, quantization of a miracle, or where there is, um, you should read my digit, yeah. Um, or there is some chern simons partition function, because I, I really don't know what, what's its content in terms of semi-classical physics that I'm used to. But now the trans series tells you, well in some, and now I'm making it up, in some maybe it's the conifold, uh, action that's that's relevant. In other one, maybe it's the orbifold action which is relevant, and so you know how to how to decode. So so that answers your question, right? So the trans series is telling you what's the semi-classical content of each of these different non-perturbative definitions, and the number of non-perturbative definitions you could have. It's associated, of course, with the different choices you can make for the trans series parameter for the boundary condition. However, some might be nice, and some might just be the choice of a number with really no content behind. All right, so I have about 15 minutes left. Let me tell you something about the matrix model side. What if I want to do this at the level of the gauge theory? Well, actually, as you will see, we can do a little bit more. Because now I have you know, a way to write down my partition function. Here's for the permission one matrix model with some polynomial potential. These matrices are n by n, and I just normalize by the volume of, of the gauge symmetry. And here's the string of and again, just like for the string theory, in the adduct large n limit, where t is going to be my adduct coupling, the free energy has a standard asymptotic genus expansion. So you know it just matches against what we're seeing here. And what we're going to be looking at is going to be a quantic potential. It's just the simplest non-trivial example you could think of, uh, where eigenvalues can accumulate around the critical points of the solution, and they're sort of two. Uh, standard things that you can do, which is look at the one cut or the two cut, the Z Z symmetric two cut solutions. This is the spectral curves associated to each of the, of the of those possibilities. And here I'm just plotting for you the positivity of the holomorphic effective potential, um, and basically and the cuts that you can see here. And instantons here, this is known for a long time. Instantons, basically, first person to notice this was Francois Arvid in the in the 90s. Instantons are associated to B cycles in this geometry, so they're sort of Easy to compute. All right. So if you play this game, basically what's going on is that, um, just to remind you, if I want to solve this matrix model, usually what I do is I go to diagonal basis, and then I, that creates for me a measure for orthogonal polynomials. I compute my orthogonal polynomials, and I get some equations for what these polynomials looks like in terms of cer certain recursion coefficients. And you know, if you iterate them in the computer, this solves for you the matrix model. Now, there's a continuous version of, of those so-called string equations. Here's the one for the quartic, where these r's are basically these recursion coefficients in the matrix model. And you can see here is that this is a finite difference equation. It's not a differential equation. And by the way, somebody, I don't remember, at, at the school was asking, yeah, but you have, you're doing a differential equation, so on. So I've just shown you that for the hallmark anomaly, I, I didn't even have any equation in some sense. I was just looking at recursive uh, relations. Here, I also don't have a differential equation. I have a finite difference equation. So I really don't, it doesn't matter where you start from. It's just, you know, as long as you know how to crank the wheel, you can go. This is nonlinear, that's r times r, and it's finite difference. And, okay, this is a long story I'm not going to go through. You can do the whole calculation, and here's the result. You're going to have instant connections n minus a. This is what I just 
vaguely alluded to that there is a resonance phenomenon that creates for you the, the closed stream expansion from the point of view of this, of this business. And then basically you have lots of coefficients. And this, these are rational functions of x, and you can compute a lot of them. Not all, again, this is a nonlinear problem, it's not exactly so, but a lot. So we've computed a non perturbative solution, and you should be able to go anywhere on the complex. There's lots of checks at this. I'm not going to show, again, numerical checks on the validity of solutions. There's lots of them you can look up. Uh, another interesting thing that you can do, and I want to start by, by, by addressing this, is the double scaling limit. So there's a natural double scaling limit uh, of the matrix model. Here for the quantum matrix model, it reduces basically, it, it's a, if you want to think about it just from the previous equation, there's a double scaling critical limit of this equation where r is going to become u, the function u, and where uh, g string is basically going to become the variable z, and u is basically the specific heat of 2D quantum gravity that you can compute by this, you know, over 100 years equation, you know, found by Paul Polymetric in 1905 or whatever. Uh, it has a, a perturbative solution. This is well known for a long time. Here's the first few guys. And if you go and see how the Z relates to the string coupling, this is an expansion power of yes squared. Okay. It's turning string expansion. And now it's not too hard to see why there should be two instant actions. And this is because basically because the point of the equation is second order. That naturally creates for you two, the two actions. That it's resonant is a bit harder to see, <coughs> but you can also see that it's resonant. And the general two parameter trace series solution looks very much like before. And here I'm plotting already for GS, by the way. This is the relation to GS and Z. And there's log contributions as well. And here's an example of a test that you can do that everything is matching. You can um, check what's happening at genus 30. So I'm just basically um, looking at the larger the growth of the perturbative guys. And I'm feeding non perturbative information. You know, just like the test we had before, and I see how, how close I am to the exact result. So this is the number of digits that you get correct, of, if you want, of the perturbative guys, of these guys, well, at order 30. It's, it's basically a, a rational number. And the instantons, there's factors of pi, there's factors of square root of 3, all these non-rational non, uh, non guys. And you see that if I put six instantons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, at genus 30, I get 60 decimal places correct. So let me just leave you with this check, which I think is convincing that everything is good. The Stokes constants, that's the problem I've been alluding to. They're complicated. There's one number, that's sort of the forward guy that we know how to compute. Francois David computed this for a long time ago. That's the only one. All the other ones we don't. I think some of them, you probably can guess what they are probably going to be. But the other ones, you know, you, there's numerical tests you can make, and there's even web pages for this, where you plug the number and it tells you what, what is it made of, you know, later numbers, whatever. Nothing. We have absolutely no idea what these numbers are. They're not all independent. There's many relations in between them. But still, we'd like to know. So if anyone can tell me what one of these numbers is, except for the first two, thank you very much, I'll be very So, but this is something that you have to feed it. And then, what can you do, let's see. 10 minutes, maybe I can show some plots. Uh, now let's just do some plots. What can we do with these expressions that we've computed? So here I have the phase diagram of the quartic model at complex Toft coupling. So I'm varying things on the complex uh, Toft parameter. And this is what the, the diagram looks like. So the, the, the lines I'm plotting here, they're empty Stokes lines. They're phase boundaries, if you want. Remember that there was the Stokes, the guy was growing up, there was empty Stokes phase transition. So what I have here is I have the one cut phase, it's this bulb here, and the two cut phase is this other bulb here. There's a natural double scaling limit to the Ponlevy 1 equation and to the Ponlevy 2 equation. So this is 2D gravity, that's 2D supergravity. And then there's the green and pink regions. And the green and pink regions are a bit more complicated. So what we know about the blue regions, the one and the two cuts, is that there, we call them Stokes phases. And they have the usual, well, I should read 1 over n squared perturbative expansion, and they have exponentially suppressed non perturbative contributions. But then the non perturbative contributions become a further 1, and I jump into the green region. The green region, it's what we call an anti Stokes phase, and we have oscillatory asymptotics in n. They're given by theta like functions. 
which somehow means from the string dual point of view that I have a bunch of geometries that all contribute at the same time. So it's you know a very stringy regime, or very well in N it's a very quantum gravity regime. And then there's an even worse phase, but which is generic because it's the one that goes to large of this coupling, which is the pink region, where eigenvalues, here I'm plotting how eigenvalues uh, cluster, they cluster into trivalent configurations. This is a numerical solution for the eigenvalues. And now here I have more intricate theta-like asymptotic. So even it will be even more complicated from the point of view of the string dual. How can I understand analytically these phases? So here we have some expectations. So what can we do? Let's try to, to do a resummation of the trans series. And let's start with the Ponlevier case. Because resummations will allow us to describe these different phases. So the Ponlevier solution, uh, U, this is known since uh, 1908 paper of Boutreau on the classification of singularities of Ponleville solutions, of Ponleville 1 in particular, we know that it has double poles. And they are scattered across the complex point. Which, by the way, this is very interesting, this translates to simple zeros of the partition function. So we can already, you know, physically think that there is some connection to the n zero somehow in the phase transitions. The idea is to reorganize, now let's just look at the one parameter trans series. It's a double sum, here as I'm writing it schematically, there's a sum over genus, if you want, and there's a sum over instanton numbers. And I'm going to try to do the sum in the other way, because it turns out that if I do the sum first over instantons, I can actually get exact results. At leading order, these guys here, these UGNs at order, at leading order in G, they grow linearly. You can just see how they grow in N. And so I can try to do a, what we call an analyte, a linear analytic transfer summation by summing the leading terms for all the n guys. So here is the sum. I introduce a variable tau, which basically takes into account this exponential guy and the transfer parameter. And now I sum, I can sum exactly in n, and I have a new expansion that looks like this. And the leading guy, which includes all instantons, but that leading order in genus, which is that function there, can be computed exactly by following the red arrow. And the result is here. That's it. So that's great. Because you see, I do have double poles. They're all at tau equals 1. You say, hang on, didn't you have an array of poles? Yes, I had. But remember that tau is this function it's here. So tau equals 1, if I want to translate it back to the z plane, I have to do the inversion of the Lambert W. And the Lambert W has an array of solutions. And by the way, if in an other adequate variable, this is just a generate case of the virus fractality function, which is something we're supposed to be finding in this point of story. So at leading order, I can produce, here's the classification of Boudreau. There's basically three classes of solutions. Uh, poles of only three organized according to these five uh, pizza slices. There's this, the so-called tritrogeo, triple truncated solution, which is described by the perturbative series alone the truncated truncated solution, where I have fields of poles in three adjacent solutions, and the general solution. This, you can think of it as different phases. And basically, this linear resummation gives me tau equals 1. And tau equals 1 is, if you want, this whole line once I do this whole array once I do the Lambert W inversion. You say, OK, that's good, but that's just an array. Can I do better? And the way you can do better is by forgetting about u, that's the specific heat, and let's go directly to the partition function. Now, the leading contribution to the partition function is the, the, green, the green dots. It, it's not going linearly anymore. I mean, if you just do the linear thing here, you have tau minus 1. That's a simple 0. And you can start going linearly. But you know, if you look at what this is actually telling you, is that the leading growth is quadratic. So if you do the quadratic analytic transfer summation, it turns out that it's much more efficient. And you immediately get all arrays. So if I do that, I immediately get all of them. I have the full array of, of zeros. And you say, well, but that was just leading order in G-string. That's true. But now G-string corrections are basically just G-string corrections. They're just small corrections to you know, locate more precisely <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, where that array is supposed to be. So I have, uh, how many minutes do I have? Can I still show some plots for five? OK. <coughs> what about the matrix model? Let me just, now we're just going to see. Uh, well, a movie that I'm going to display with my finger. Let's go out 
that's the phase diagram, let's go out in that direction. I'm going to be facing different phases of the system. Can the train series reproduce the different phases? So here's the numerical result. So here is blue, that blue is not exactly the dark blue, but anyway, and there's green. <coughs> and I'm plotting here the little r's. These are the coefficients, the recursive coefficients in the orthogonal polynomials. And I'm seeing how do they behave. And I'm just, you know, normalizing them against the perturbative, the first half, just to make it simple. And you see, well, they're very nicely behave while I am in the Stokes phase. And then they start oscillating. How can I reproduce this, this information? That's the absolute value, this is the phase. And you say, well, let's try, you know, all days. I only have the perturbative data, so let's put in the perturbative data and see what goes on. The perturbative data is really great when you're in Stokes phases. But once you change phase, it really has no idea where it's going. So, okay, I forget the one instant on. Maybe with the one instant on, things get a bit better because, you know, the exponential is taking lead. And now you can see that in green is the one instant. Oh yeah, it goes on for a while, but it just has no idea about the oscillations. It cannot match any oscillations. Can I do any better? Let's go up to three instantons. So the more instantons I do, the better I match the beginning. But I have absolutely still no idea about the oscillations. All right, let's try to use this idea that I'm going to do analytic transfer summation and change the order, maybe. In that way, I mean, I'm sort of grabbing all the instantons along at the same time, at leading order, maybe that's better. So that's linear analytic transfer summation. That's better, all right, because it knows that there should be some oscillation, but it doesn't know how many. So in some sense, this is like for Pondifier, where I just saw the first array. And here, I'm just seeing the first oscillation. So what about if instead of doing just the linear, which is for the R's, I do the quadratic, which, you know, it's the same growth that I have here for the, for the Actually, I'm sorry, I have one intermediate, which is including next to leading order. So next to leading order, I'm looking at the second array. And I see the first oscillation. But what I really want to do is the quadratic, where I put everybody in at the same time. And that's in red. And you can see that I can find all oscillations. Of course, the more I move forward, the less I match them, because I still need small corrections to match them all. But qualitatively, I have everything at once. And what I can do here for just one line, I can do generically for the partition function and find all the Lien zeros of this problem. So here's a, here, here they are. That's the Lien zeros uh, of the partition function. And you see how they're um, behaving across the anti Stokes region. <coughs> and you can compute against numerical data. Here's some numerical data. This is um, 100 eigenvalues. And this was a, a, you know, a long calculation. It ran in the CERN cluster for two or three weeks. And that's five minutes on the laptop. I, I understand that's less high in values, but you already see the same qualitative thing all at the same time. So this also shows you how you know, powerful these methods are at the quantitative and qualitative level. You get a lot of mileage out of it. Um, so how, how long? Do I still have one minute or two? Maybe I can uh, show you some more plots. Sorry? Three minutes. OK, so let me show you some more plots. What if I say, OK, that's great. So we have all these. Uh, large end physics, which is you know very interesting because I can match against strength theory, and so now I know about all these other phases that I get out of the gauge theory that I would like to see mm, made more explicit for strength theory. What about if I really don't care about strength theory, but I only care about gauge theory, and then I say, well, you know, that's the, the old story of, of, of the, that n equals three is, is is large. So what can I go to small n and have a finite n results? Well, again, this method should allow you to do that. So here's basically the idea, which is I already showed you in the first slides. If I have a free energy, now I've, I've made n explicit. I removed the g string. I'm saying I no longer care about string theory. <coughs> I have n. I have a toft. What should I do? You know, it's the Borel-Pade story we discussed at the beginning, and then I have to do Borel-Pade et al. summation. What do I get if I do this? And here's some checks. So this is for the the R coefficient and for the free energies. And here's stuff that you're computing. At different, so here for this table, I'm fixing n equals 3, correct? For the, the r's and the f's. And then I, I look at the, the contributions that come from the perturbative, the one instant on, the two instant on, the three instant. I, because it's n equals 3, it's a 3 by 3 matrix model. I actually can do the computation analytically and find a number. That's the exact number here. And then I can see 
how many of my digits are matching against the exact result? So the blue is the perturbative, then one instanton, two instantons, three instantons. And what you can see here is that, you know, in a nice region of, of, of N and T, that basically the instantons are incrementally getting me closer and closer and closer to the exact result. But, which is nice, but they do a little bit more, because my trans series, I didn't have to specify that N was an integer. So I can actually compute, and here is the partition function, I can do the interpolation at non-integer N. So, in, in, so here's the, the integer guides, but the, this is the three instanton contribution. I can see how to vary the partition function at continuous N. <coughs> and then you say, okay, that's great. Can, can you push it a little bit further? Let's try to go into the complex plane. Here I have n equals 3, t equals a half, and I'm rotating its face <coughs> for the imaginary and the real part of r at n equals 3. And what you see is that the planar result is dotted, and in blue I have the perturbative. So the perturbative contribution is great in some regions. Now here it's perfectly fine. But once you start moving into the complex plane, it's just going to follow your planar result. Because of precisely their Stokes phenomenon. There's going to be phase transitions where the instantons are going to dominate and take over the 1 over n squared. 1 over n squared no longer knows what's going on, and you really need all the instantons to go through. And once you realize that all these instantons are giving you the exact physics, then you can say, okay, <coughs> I can go non perturbative, negative n. <coughs> you can see that qualitatively, the perturbative takes off after, this is just a numerical glitch, by the way, by lack of data, so this should be screwed here. The perturbative is going the wrong direction, and up to three instantons, it's showing a different behavior at negative n. Then at some region, you, have, you only have finite amount of data, numerics is no longer reliable. But up to the region where numerics is reliable, you get a new function, and more than going negative, you can go completely complex. So here's the third instanton for uh, the partition function at the complex n. <coughs> okay, let me wrap up. So I hope I've convinced you that research and transference series are very powerful tools in, in string theory in this talk, but also in, in, the, in the lectures at, at the school. I think that was clear that they give you new approaches towards non-perturbative constructions. So one should generically think of subservables as described by research and functions, and you can define them non-perturbatively starting out from perturbation theory if you play all these games. This naturally extends non-perturbative results towards continuous values of the parameters. Now I've shown you here n because that's sort of the cool thing to show, but you can think of any other thing that you want to vary continuously. And furthermore, they provide semi-classical decodings of non-perturbative results. I mean, if I tell you that my non-perturbative function is some, my non-perturbative result is some weird function, perhaps it's, it's, it's different to make contact with sort of semi-classical physics that we have intu intuition about. This is doing the decoding for you, so it gives you the intuition that you might be lacking. Of course, there's still lots of things to be done. We have to deal completely with these non-perturbative phases and do other matrix models or other toric or non-toric geometries. Um, but anyways, uh, hopefully this will be, uh, in years to come, a systematic tool to access finite and complex stuff. Thank you very much. Questions? Well, let's thank Ricardo again. Thank you. And we'll resume at 11.05.